Welcome back to Lies, the bit of extra history where I get to fess up to all the mistakes we made and tell you all the stories we never got to tell you on the regular episodes. Because this whole series was about incredibly complex financial transactions made intentionally obtuse by people who didn't want anyone actually following what they were doing, I lied to you as little as I could. So this time around during the Lies episode, I'm going to do something a little bit different and answer some of the questions that came up because the comment stream was full of great ones. And because I basically got to say what I got out of researching this period in the last 30 seconds of the show, if I can get through all the questions, I'm going to talk about Walpole. Uh, but first, things we actually screwed up. Uh, actually, even that's a lie. I'm going to hijack this whole section and just talk about something that you guys brought up in the comments that I thought was awesome when I researched it. And that's the weird naming conventions and the borders of England and the UK and Great Britain. Uh, but before we get to that, some quick discrepancies. We put some pound signs in the wrong place. We put uh, dollar signs into pound signs and blunt eyes. Um, some of the images of the stock had the word sword blade on them instead of South Seas, which it should have been. Uh, oh, and <laughs> on our British theme. So once again, we screwed up the flag. Uh, there's even a note in the script to check this, but uh, I kind of hope this doesn't become a running EH joke. Because pretty soon we're just gonna have the UK flag filled with dragons. But anyway, uh, onto the comment that I thought was really cool. I feel weird about it because it's two places where everyone thought we were wrong, but I don't actually think we were, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is British legislative naming conventions. In the first episode, we say that there was no Great Britain before the Act of Union. And a lot of people said we meant there was no UK before the Act of Union. But I'm pretty sure that's incorrect. Well, actually, I'm pretty sure they're both correct. You see, Great Britain actually started with the Acts of Union with Scotland in 1707. And the UK came to be in 1801 with the shockingly similar named Acts of Union with Ireland. Which leads me right to this. Because while I was researching other things totally unrelated uh, that you guys called out, guess what I ran into? It was Walpole. No, <laughs> actually, here we go. In our first episode, we showed a map of England and a bunch of people called out that Wales is actually a separate country. This is absolutely true today, but thankfully, wait for it, what is now so helpfully called the Acts of Union of 1536, I'm like 90% sure that Wales was a fully integrated principality of England at the time of our story. Uh, if I got that wrong, I am extremely sorry. <laughs> but now, I am never doing anything on the show where we have to keep the Acts of Union straight. But enough about English border names. On to things I directly lied to you about. In the first episode, I mentioned that the UK actually made payments towards this debt in this very year. This is 100% true. Uh, I'll link the article below that talks about it. But it's not because they've been paying down this debt for the last three centuries. Governments generally juggle a lot of debt and only actually pay down the highest interest stuff. So the UK just never got around to paying off some of the lower interest debt that came from the South Seas bubbles. Of course, for all you UK citizens out there, that does mean that you've been paying interest on the debt John Blunt was playing with for the last 300 years. Oh, also, throughout this, I periodically tried to explain things by comparing amounts of money in the time period to modern amounts. This is super useful for uh, both explanations and making you feel how much they were playing with, but it's impossible to do accurately. My research says that it's pretty safe to say that a pound in that period had about the buying power of 100 pounds today, but that's super loose and doesn't account for the fact that the rich and the average person were working on fundamentally different scales of money. While the average person could easily rent a place to live for a few pounds a month, a duchess might spend a thousand pounds on a dress that today would only cost 10,000 pounds. Uh, so take all the numbers of comparison with a, a grain of salt. But okay, uh, on to questions. Let's start with the fundamental one. How does the stock market work? Where do stocks come from? Stocks work by supply and demand, like any other co commodity. Uh, the only difference is that they have no intrinsic value. So. Instead of stocks, let's say beans. I have some delicious, delicious beans. 
and I offer to sell them to you for $5. Why are they worth that? No particular reason. It's what I think you'll pay for them, and that's an IPO, or initial public offering. If you don't pay for them, then they're not worth that. And so I start lowering my price until I find an amount that you're willing to pay because I need money, I don't really want these beans. So at some point, I lower the price enough that you think buying the beans is now worth it. Let's say $2. Now that's the price of the beans. But if the guy next to you shouts, hey, I'd really like those beans, I'll give you $3 for them. Well, now that's the price. My beans are simply worth whatever they were last traded for. So why do people buy stock in the first place if they only have made up value? Because the value isn't only imaginary. It represents an amount of ownership in the company. If I had a company and I had 100 shares and you bought one share, you'd own 1% of the company. If someone wanted to buy the company later down the line, they'd have to give you 1% of whatever they were willing to buy the company for uh, because that's how much the company you own. And that could be a lot more than what you paid for that stock in the first place. Oh, and the other reason that stock has value is because it sometimes comes with dividends. When a company makes a profit, it may pay out a dividend, which is basically means you take a portion of that profit and you split it amongst all the shareholders. So if you hold 1% of my company and we pay out $200 in dividends, you get $2. The reason that companies do this is not only to keep their shareholders happy, but it's also how major shareholders get money out of the company without having to sort of sell their stake. Uh, imagine you founded a company and now it's making a profit of $100 million a year. Well, your salary may only be $100,000 a year, but you still hold 10% of the company in stock. And so uh, let's say you get the company to pay out a dividend of $10 million to shareholders. Well, of that, you now get to keep a million dollars. There's a lot more complexities here, but that's a super short version. Uh, if that was old hat for you, thanks for bearing with it. Uh, we can now talk about some of the more complicated things that happened during the episode itself. Okay, so let's talk about what Blunt did with the Army debentures in the first episode and why it would certainly be illegal today, because lots of people asked about that. Basically, it's insider trading. Insider trading is when uh, someone with knowledge not available to the public uses that knowledge in order to make a profit off the market. The problem with insider trading is that if you allow it, all of us who are not insiders would get killed at the market, discouraging investment and thus sort of defeating the point of the market in the first place. You'll hear our people argue about insider trading, but uh, I don't want to get into it. It's, but that's the reason that most countries have laws against it. Uh, oh, and a number of people wanted to know how Blunt could just make the stock rise and how it could just keep rising when he was issuing more shares. Well, this is, th this whole thing's insane. But because stock pay prices are based solely on what you can sell the stock for, not on any intrinsic worth uh, of the stock itself, he could raise the stock through hype. In that time especially, people expected dividends from their stock. And so they'd buy stock based on what they thought the potential profitability of the company was. So for example, uh, they figured that if a company was going to make enough to pay out $50 a share in dividends each year, then those shares had to be worth at least, say, $150 because you can hold on to it for a few years, collect the dividends, and still sell them when you needed to, hopefully at a higher price because the company is even more profitable by the time you sell them. So, if Blunt could keep convincing people that the South Seas company was going to be making more and more and more money, he could keep getting the stock to rise. And as people saw it rise, they thought, uh, this is hot, I better get it now, I better get it before it gets even more expensive. And so they rushed to join in, pushing the price higher, which is sort of how a bubble happens. And then on top of that, Blunt did all sorts of tricky things, like lending people money to buy his stock. So they'd only have to pay $100 to buy, to set the stock price at $500 because the South Sea company would front them the rest of the money and the stock price is whatever it was last sold at, so it's now $500 stock. So how about all that new stock he kept issuing? How come that doesn't deflate the price? And this is a great question. This is one of those sort of things that you have to wrestle with, with stocks, or really with any commodity on, on an open market. But uh, let's say I have five V. And I only have five beans, but people really want these beans. These are some good beans. 
and I have outstanding orders for 100 beans. Well, I go back to my garden and I grab 10 more beans. I could sell them at the same price I was selling them at previously, but since I know I have 100 people eagerly excited to buy these beans, I can now actually come back to them and say, uh, beans are back in stock, but I've only got 10, so they go to the highest bidder. The price goes up. Uh, so as long as Blunt could continue to hype and could continue to have his hype have demand outpace supply, adding to supply wouldn't actually decrease the price. Which leads me right into the next question. How did convincing people that a Jacobite Rebellion was crushed push up stock prices? This is where it gets all sorts of crafty because it involves manipulating behavior as much as it involves manipulating stocks. But when people are euphoric, they tend to invest. And when people believe in their country, they tend to invest. Uh, and actually, whenever instability decreases, it means that companies face less risk. And so it's a better idea to invest, i.e. a civil war raging through the country would probably be bad for business. And so even savvy investors in this case are more likely to invest. Oh, this is one of my favorites. So did the South Sea Company actually ever do any trading or make any money in the South Seas? <laughs> so trading, yes. Money, no. Uh, the story is great, uh, except for the fact that it involves a lot of slavery, but here's the deal. The first attempt at trading in the South Seas was trading slaves to Jamaica. They filled up their ships, went to Jamaica, and the authorities there promptly told them they didn't believe their papers saying they had the right to trade there, so they kind of wandered around for a while until they sold their slaves at a loss. They tried again with slaves, but basically didn't figure on import duties and taxes, so lost money again. Then. Despite everyone and their mother telling them no one wanted wool in Cartagena, they loaded up their ships with good old English wool and set sail. Then their ships basically sat with wool rotting in their holds for several years outside of Cartagena. Oh, things I had to cut from the episode. I had to cut Blunt's, Blunt's nemesis, John Law. That was just the subplot we didn't have a time for. but. This is the guy who basically invented using paper money. Like Blunt, his name is also totally fabulous because he spent most of his life running from the law. And so he ended up in France where he tried to use finance to make the country a better place. Of course, he turned it into a police state with the horrible midnight executions, but in the end, at least he was trying. His success, though, at using innovative finance to revitalize France was at least in part why people were so eager to let Berlin run wild. And it's part of why I love this period. There's all this stuff about modern finance that we just believe, that we take for granted, that's really being invented here. It always blows my mind to be reminded that for the majority of human history, people would have looked at you as crazy if you tried to tell them that they should take paper in exchange for valuable goods and services. Uh, even if you promised that that paper was redeemable for something, which ours is not, and yet today we just sort of believe in money. You do a bunch of work, somebody gives you a bunch of greenbacks, and you call it fair without worrying about the fact that uh, if the U.S. were to disappear tomorrow, all you'd actually have was paper. It makes me always wonder about cryptocurrency and if we'll think that way about it in the future. Not the gray market cryptocurrency that we're dealing with now, but the first digital currency to be adopted by a government. Probably Switzerland. And that's what's so cool about this period. There's so many parallels to today and so many things to think about. Oh, and I had to cut reading Robert Knight's letter to Parliament, which he delivered to them just before he booked it for France. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but it is just too good not to read most of. So, get this, this is what Robert Knight sent to Parliament. This is what Parliament woke up on their Monday morning to find on their desk. I write this document from a true sense of obligation I am under to make up my accounts with the company and to pay them their full demands. And though self-preservation has obliged me to withdraw myself from the resentment against the directors and myself, yet I am not conscious to myself of having done any one thing that I can reproach myself for, so far as it relates to the honest and sincere intention and the zeal for the company. But I can and do charge myself for a great many indiscretions 
and am, besides the concern I must be under for leaving my own friends and family, very sensibly touched with what you are likely to suffer on this account. And it will be the more, I am afraid, from your want of unanimity, which I heartily recommend to you in the future, and I am sure wish you as well as you wish yourselves. I I'm going to skip the next bit because this middle part is basically him telling them that they can keep whatever they find in his work desk. Um, oh, and telling him them that if a bunch of rascally clerks uh, come asking for their money, that he lost them, not to pay them because they probably were never going to pay the full amount for their shares anyway. Uh, and then we get to this last bit. I have taken with me but little more than a sufficiency to maintain myself, and the effects left will more than answer for all the deficiencies. I have bought no land in trust for me, nor have I ever conveyed or settled any part of that I formerly or have lately bought. It remains to answer any demands on me from the company and the legislature. I have withdrawn myself only to avoid the weight of the inquiry, which I found too heavy for me, and I am sensible that it would have been impossible for me to have avoided the appearance and the charge of prevarication and perjury, not from my own intention to do so, but from the largeness and extent of the inquiry, and the nature and largeness of the transactions. I am sure I am a good deal concerned to add to your present difficulties. So I must say, I have deserved better usage than I have had from the court this last week. But I say this without any resentment, otherwise than that it has been an additional weight that I had before me. Can you even handle it? <laughs> He's all like, I found your parliamentary inquiry into how I sunk the national economy and made millions of dollars doing so a little stressful, so I'm gonna go. Oh, and um, you can keep whatever you find in my desk, though. I'm just gonna take a little bit of money with me. So good. I don't even know why he wrote this. It's brilliant. But all right. Um, now I can finally get to the last bit. I end up having to cut a lot about Walpole. He really does deserve his own series. He pretty much invented what it means to be prime minister in England. And to this day, he holds the record for longest serving prime minister in English history. But this means our it was Walpole moment keeps happening in England for the next 20 years. So instead of talking about what I got out of researching this episode, Here's a few choice Walpole moments before we go. Uh, so first one, Walpole liked his spies. During one of the Jacobite uprisings, one of his Jacobite informants came to him, and in the middle of telling him his information, the man suddenly stands up and says, why don't I kill you right now? Because he was a Jacobite, right? And Walpole was fighting the Jacobites. But Walpole just looks at him and says, because I am a younger man and a stronger. And the man just sits back down and continues informing on the Jacobites. And, and this one, this one is, is actually my favorite. One morning, uh, Walpole's arch rival walks into his office to let him know that he was going to charge him in the House of Commons the next day with uh, basically corruption and all this stuff because it was the 18th century and that was just the polite thing to do in those days. And Walpole responds by quoting Horace. And basically saying, uh, I have a clear conscience. I do not pale before any charges. But he says it wrong. And this is hilarious for two reasons. One, because Walpole was not known to be a great reader. This was probably the only passage of Horace he had memorized. And of course it's the one thing he had memorized. It's a passage about denying guilt. I just imagine him sitting there as he's looking over it thinking, you know, I know I'm going to get to use this one someday. And second, he said it in Latin, and he botches the Latin, and the other guy calls him out on it. So here are two arch rivals, one of whom has just told the other that he's going to charge him with high crimes in the state house the next day. Two men who control the most powerful nation on earth, and here they're good naturedly debating the quality of Walpole's Latin. But Walpole, always a little stubborn, says, I'll bet you a guinea I'm right. His nemesis says, you're on, and they call in the clerk of the house to get a copy of the book to settle the bet. Walpole was, of course, wrong, so he tosses the other guy a guinea. The other guy catches it, holds it up to everyone around, and says, this is the only money I've received from the house in many years, and it shall be the last. And that coin is now in the British Museum with a sign from it, from the fellow who won it. 
which basically says, this is the only coin received from Robert Walpole whose transfer shouldn't make the giver and the receiver blush. And it gets better because then he goes, and this is why you should learn Latin. Boom! Score one for telling the kids to learn their Latin because it's how you get honest money out of Walpole. Oh, and because this is extra history, I have to end this with a story about when Walpole was old and retired. Because at the time, someone asked him now, because he'd always been a busy man, what he did with his time and whether he read history. To which he replied, I don't read history. I know it must be false. See you all next week when Extra History goes weekly and we're going to explore the Zulu Empire. It's going to be awesome. Take care, everyone. <laughs>